nationalisme, c'est la guerre. And then there was light, yes. Um, a warm welcome, uh, everybody, today at the, uh, the event, The Spirit of 68. Um, I was born in 76, so I will be only introducing people today and keep my mouth shut for the rest. Um, uh, we have some excellent experts on this year, and we'll, uh, I'll introduce them in a second. Um, we'll look at the remarkable year 1968, the revolutionary year 1968, but also uh, at the question whether or not we uh, glorify the year 1968 too much. Some of the uh, people here have a pretty strong opinion on that. Um, uh, and we'll do that with some remarkable guests from across Europe. Uh, I'll introduce them in a second. First, this program, of course, is part of the second forum on European culture, an initiative of the Bali and Dutch culture. Um, it started out yesterday, we'll be here until Sunday evening, and this year's theme is Act for Democracy. Artists, thinkers, politicians, journalists from across the world will be here uh, discussing the challenges facing Europe at this crucial point in history. Just look at this week's papers, the situation in Italy and Eastern Europe, the relation to the US, of course, the relation to Russia, um, and you start to realize there are many urgent choices to be made. But today we'll look at 1968, the lessons of 68, and before I introduce our main speakers, let me talk about a related project, which is the pop-up museum of the Iron Curtain project. Uh, some of you may have been upstairs in the Bali already. Um, it's right there, the pop-up museum. Um, let's first watch a short trailer of this project. project and one of the people behind the project is here, Emi Colau. <laughs> Let's stand in the light. Um, just a, a brief explanation. We got a little taste. Oh, sorry. I thought you had a microphone. I'll get one here. <clears throat> I understood this. This I knew. Um, you can hold it yourself if you want. You. Um, yeah, we got a little taste of the project, but can you describe uh, what it is exactly and why you initiated it? Uh, the Iron Curtain project is a multimedia project. Uh, we are a group of journalists, but also designers. And uh, we uh, reflect on the heritage of the Iron Curtain. And more or less, we try to uh, describe the Europe of today. And it's uh, by connecting interactive, it to obviously. The past. Yeah. People can listen. Yeah, you can read stories online, but we also organize events all through Europe. And we started to make uh, pop-up museums uh, because then we could uh, tell our stories and uh, travel with them. And this 68 museum is one of them. Upstairs. 
Yeah, upstairs. which I will remind go the there. audience yeah. in, in about two hours. Don't go. One more question. Oh, yeah. Uh, you started out in Poland, the, the, yes. uh, the, this particular project. Yeah. Uh, what was the response there? Yeah, it's so f it's funny when you uh, for the whole project when we go uh, to Eastern Europe, the first question almost always is like, well, do you know that our history is different than yours? And that was the first reaction in Poland as well. And um, here in the Netherlands, for, for example, 68 is connected with the hippies on smoking weed on the dam, that kind of nostalgia. But for Poland, it was a very, very, very painful year. And so first they check if we know that. Mm -hmm. And after that, they are, I think, happy that we also... It's uh, part of the project, yeah, Polish that, that, history that, that as well. That there is attention from here to their history and they like to see the stories uh, of the other side. Mm -hmm. And for them it's, it's, it's a bit strange that this whole uh, Marxist sentiment would, was really big here in mm -hmm. the 60s. For them it's, yeah, they were suffering from it. So they have a totally different, different. view on that. So um, it's here until Sunday. Yeah. And then the next stop is Prague. Prague. Okay. In two weeks. So get over there later. Get over there. But not now. Um, no. You, you can leave this here. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you, Emmy Colau. <coughs> um, what if? That's the big question um, people ask themselves in 1968. You all got a flyer, um, I think, upon entrance. Um, and I ask you to think about that question in 68. The question was, what if we can have a different kind of government? What if we can have a different kind of structure? What if we can stop the war? What if we can um, uh, grant everybody the, the same basic human rights? So the question also for the attendees, which we'll uh, hear about in a moment, is uh, what is, what if, finish the sentence, what is the what if question right now? So we'll talk about that um, over the next hour and a half. But first, for an introduction, I would like to introduce Roel Janssen. He's an acclaimed Dutch journalist. Uh, used to work for NSA Handelsblad for years, uh, a long past working for the paper. And he was a curious young man in 1968, and he decided to travel to Paris uh, once the revolution uh, started. I think you were 20 years old. Roel Janssen published a book this year uh, about 1968, and he'll uh, give us an introduction about that year. Roel Janssen. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Eilko. Um, it's a pleasure being here and talk a little bit about, very briefly, about uh, what happened in 1968. I was indeed uh, 20 years old and with uh, two student friends we decided on a Wednesday afternoon um, after a couple of beers, well, why not go to Paris? Because we read in the newspapers that something was happening there and so we took off and didn't actually even have a map or hardly any money, so we went to Paris and uh, we parked the car early in the morning at uh, Notre Dame because that was in the center of Paris and we fell asleep and then at 9 or 10 in the morning a policeman, a flic as they say in France, knocked on the window and said, hey, you're not allowed to park here. So that was the beginning of our experience at the uh, Paris Evenement de May, the movement of May, the uh, Paris May Revolution. So what was it? Well, dare to dream and rise up. Uh, go into the streets, uh, occupy squares, parks, buildings, and believe in change and in freedom, optimism, um, ingenuity and energy. Those were the, 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 the orders of the day. Um, utopias are no Fata Morganas, but they're a new world that is within reach, within reach. Sous les pavés, c'est la plage. Under the cobblestones is the, is the, is the, uh, is the, is the, uh, is the beach. Ah, sorry. Yeah. Um, be realistic and demand the impossible. Or in the United States, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? Those were some of the phrases that reflect the spirit of 1968. So what happened all in that year, in that pivotal year of the long late 60s, the long period of change and social movements and activities that took place, let's say, between somewhere 
taking Amsterdam as a starting point 1964 with the, uh, the anti-rook Robert Jasper Grootveld at het Lievertje, or the Spui, till the early 70s, so the late, the long years of the 68. Um, what happened in that time? Well, very briefly, the post-war generation, the post-war youth, came to adulthood. The baby boomers stormed the established order. They rebelled against the authority, the authority of their parents, the authority of uh, the teachers, the school teachers, the uh, professors at the universities, the, 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 the vicars, the, um, the priests, the government, the authorities, the police, everybody. They, are, they, they rebelled against any kind of form of authority. It was an anti-authoritarian movement. They wanted also another, another society, a different society. And they hardly had any um, patience. They were in a hurry. We want the world and we want it now. That was a phrase of a song of Jim Morrison of the Doors at the time. It's an explosion of activism and of creativity, not only on the political field, in the political field, but also in the sphere of uh, personal and social liberation. The anti-conception pill, the availability of marijuana and hashish, the picture, the photograph of Ernesto Che Guevara, it was the sexual revolution, it was the psychedelic trip, and it was the heroic guerrilla struggle against imperialism. That all together, came all together. It was like a tsunami of protest all over the world, from Australia to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, from Mexico to Poland to Japan, Amsterdam, Rome, Brussels, Paris, of course, and Chicago. You have to take into consideration that about a third of the population in Western Europe and the United States, and even in some other countries, was under 22 years old. A third of the population. If you Compare that to the situation right now, it is, there are more 65 plusers, as we call them in Dutch, than there are 22 minors, minors. So um, there was a huge demographic bubble, so to speak, that stormed to, um, to, to conquer society. At the same time, the number of students at the university tripled, also across the board, in Mexico, in France, in the Netherlands, about a, in the 60s, the number of students at, the, at universities tripled, and the universities were not at all prepared to absorb all these. Um, prosperity and purchasing power increased tremendously in the 60s. In about 10 years' time, the real purchasing power, so the real money you could spend, increased with about 70% in 10 years. Um, consumer society started in seriousness. People were having their first little car, they were having a washing machine, they were having their first black and white televisions. And the post-war economic model was at its, oh, uh, at its high point. At the same time, there was the counterculture of the hippies. The summer of love had just passed in uh, San Francisco and in the Vondel Park here in Amsterdam. And worldwide there, was, uh, there were protests against the American involvement in the war in Vietnam, and that just on its own caused a feeling of uh, community, of solidarity, of common, common good that was worthwhile to, um, to fight for and to protest against. Youth was discovered as a lucrative market for fashion and for music, and music in itself was an Im extremely important factor in the whole sense and spirit of the 60s. The, I th you, you might say that the late 60s was a sort of a Cambrian explosion of new experimental music and new forms of pop music that, that, that conquered the world. All in all, we were the world. We are the world. But it's not only love and peace in 68. <coughs> 1968 is also the year of extreme violence. In Vietnam, the highest number of American casualties during the entire war was in 1968. And we're not, talking, not even talking about the casualties from the Viet Cong or the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese armies. The Tet Offensive took place. There was a shock for the American troops and for the American generals and politicians in Washington. Um, in Poland, it was just mentioned, um, um, there was a severe repression of, one of, the f of, of, of an uprising of the population with a very strong anti-Semitic uh, content, con uh, uh, content to it. 
Um, the Warsaw Pact suppressed with 600,000 troops, more than the Americans ever had in Vietnam, 600,000 troops. They suppressed the, um, the, the liberation, liberation, liberalization in Czechoslovakia, um, the Prague Spring, or the experiment with, of socialism with the human face. In the United States, shortly after each other, first Martin Luther King and then Robert Kennedy were killed. Um, in the black ghettos, there were, were up uprisings, riots, tremendously violent and with hundreds of hundreds of vi victims, casualties. Biafra was literally uh, starved to death, the population of Biafra. And in China, there were millions of people who died in the great proletarian and cultur cultural revolution of Mao Zedong. Ten days before the start of the Olympic Games in Mexico, at the Plaza de Tlatelolco in Mexico City, a massacre took place. Um, the police, the army and special troops started shooting on thousands and tens of thousands of uh, peaceful demonstrators. And the exact number of casualties, of victims, of death has never been revealed because the Mexican authorities have simply ignored what happened and have never given a full, never um, given a full account of what happened. But it is said that between the 500 and 1,000 and possibly 1,500 people were killed at that massacre. And 10 days later, yes, the Olympic Games started and everything was fine. Amazingly enough, France at the beginning of the year was a quiet country. President de Gaulle was 10 years in power and he seemed to be very satisfied. Things looked nice and perfect in France. He said, France is an oasis of quiet, of peace, a beacon of, beacon of calm in a turbulent world. Look at Germany, they have the problems. Look at Belgium, they have problems. Look at England, it's in an economic crisis. And France is stable, it's a stability and uh, we're doing fine and nicely. Um, in March, the front page of uh, Le Monde published an iro ironic article um, that later became very, very famous. And its headline, it's, 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 the headline was La France s'ennuie. France, France is bored. Now, Alain Geismar, who with Daniel Combadit and Jacques Sauvago was one of the leaders of the French May movement and the uprising in France, he will make clear that this image of France as a quiet country where everything was going nicely is not exactly right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Roel. And I think Roel gave a better uh, introduction uh, of Alain Geismar than, than I possibly could. So I'd like to welcome him on stage right away. Alain Geismar. Thank you. You'll be speaking in French, obviously, uh, your mother tongue, but there will be an English transcript behind you. Thank you. C'est un, un bonheur, un plaisir de s'adresser à vous pour euh, évoquer le mouvement de 68 ou le moment 68 ou son esprit. Dans ce que vous m'avez dit attendre, vous me laissez le choix entre deux intitulés, l'esprit de révolution ou l'esprit de changement. Une actrice était récemment à la télévision française sur la première chaîne et elle disait que pour elle, en 68, la vie est brusquement devenue en couleur. Pour ma part, je me sens plus à l'aise avec la formulation esprit de mai. 50 ans après 68, les archives s'ouvrent, les archives de l'État en France. L'heure est de moins en moins aux témoins et aux acteurs. Elle appartient aux historiens, aux archivistes pour les faits, aux philosophes pour l'interprétation. J'ai le sentiment d'abuser encore un moment de ma position d'acteur pour rendre compte de mon point de vue sur l'esprit de mai. D'emblée, je vous dis ma préférence affirmée pour qualifier mai 68 de mouvement ou de moment par opposition à événement terme qui rétrécit singulièrement le phénomène et le réduit à un épisode qui devient alors affadi, privé de la singularité qui fait qu'on le voit toujours, un demi-siècle plus tard, comme un fait marquant, un de ces moments où l'histoire de nos sociétés change de rythme et de cours. Révolution, esprit de révolution, existe-t-il un sens incontestable du mot révolution Pour être qualifié de révolutionnaire, un soulèvement doit-il être victorieux 
Doit-il affronter directement le pouvoir en place Doit-il avoir une direction politique reconnue Doit-il avoir un programme préétabli Un projet de société future radicalement inédite Doit-il être baigné du sang du peuple Quoi qu'il en soit, la plupart des acteurs et beaucoup de témoins de mai 68 se vivaient à l'époque comme partie prenante d'une révolution rendue possible par la rencontre improbable quelques jours plus tôt entre la France d'en bas et une très grande partie des élites. Quel mai Révolution, esprit de révolution, les lectures de mai abondent. La plus caricaturale réduit mai à un charivari, un moment d'ivresse communicatif qui étourdit la société jusqu'à la pervertir. Cette dimension, portée essentiellement par le mouvement situationniste à travers quelques slogans étourdissants qu'une poignée d'activistes a placardés sur quelques murs, a existé, comme avait existé dans les, dans les années 20 le mouvement Dada. Il serait vain de le nier. Rien ne serait plus étranger à l'esprit de mai que de refuser de voir une part fut-elle infime et extrême de ce qu'il véhicula. Cette part, pour autant, ne doit pas occulter l'essentiel qui fait l'identité du mouvement et lui assure la pérennité de sa perception comme mouvement révolutionnaire. L'atelier des beaux-arts issu de la jeune peinture est certainement plus représentatif du mouvement que certains des slogans euh, placardés sur des affiches. Et le, ce mouvement des beaux-arts était totalement intégré dans le mouvement social. Spécificité du mai français, je pense qu'une grande partie de l'originalité du mai français tient, par rapport au mouvement parallèle, tient à l'enclenchement de la grève générale rendu possible par la brèche ouverte par le mouvement universitaire. Ce mouvement universitaire a été rapidement soutenu par près des deux tiers de la population en France. Ce mouvement était lui-même très particulier parce que les professeurs, avec le SNESUB dont j'étais le secrétaire général, se joignirent très tôt aux étudiants dans la contestation de la vieille université comme dans le refus des solutions policières. Cette unité universitaire face au pouvoir gaulliste, perçue comme sourd, aveugle et brutal, a permis cette popularité qui a entraîné le premier recul notable d'un pouvoir autoritaire réputé ne jamais battre en retraite. Quand le 3 mai au soir, en revenant de Nanterre, où j'avais eu une discussion avec mes collègues qui étaient divisés au sein de notre section syndicale, j'avais tenté de mieux comprendre le tourbillon qui s'était emparé de la fac et qui avait essayé en vain. Ah, ensuite, j'avais essayé en vain d'obtenir du doyen sa réouverture. J'étais loin de me douter de ce qui allait suivre. La Sorbonne était envahie par la police. Des centaines de jeunes étudiants en costume cravate pour les garçons, en jupe plissée et soquette pour les filles, harcelaient la police, essayaient de faire sortir des fourgons leurs camarades arrêtés et jetaient d'innombrables objets sur les policiers. Quelques heures plus tard, j'appelais à la grève générale dans toutes les universités. Et très vite, en quelques jours, le mot d'ordre était suivi dans toute la France universitaire, qui visiblement était mûre pour cela. Ce mouvement n'est en aucune façon un parti. Il ne se reconnaît pas dans une organisation. Il n'a ni direction, ni programme, ni projet, autre que d'obtenir au départ la, la, la satisfaction de revendications simples et donc unificatrices. La libération des manifestants arrêtés, dont de plus en plus nombreux jeunes ouvriers, comme les rapports de police qui s'ouvrent avec les archives, le montrent. La réouverture de la Sorbonne, l'ouverture d'un débat sur l'avenir de l'université. Le mouvement de contestation se définit jour après jour en se fixant des objectifs le soir pour le lendemain. Même au-delà du mouvement universitaire, la grève générale ne sera déclarée ou appelée par aucune organisation syndicale. Cela n'a donc aucun sens de vouloir imputer au mouvement une orientation politique précise ou des buts définis a priori. Son existence et ses actes parlent pour lui et le définissent. Le recul contraint du pouvoir face à cette contestation imprévue qui résiste et bénéficie d'un important soutien ouvre la brèche dans laquelle un mouvement social et culturel va s'engouffrer et prendre la place principale après avoir découvert la faiblesse du pouvoir dont l'invisibilité proverbiale s'effondre. Jour après jour, la démarche du mouvement se révèle et se précise. Le mouvement s'en prend dès le début à la vieille université et au mandarinat, centralisateur et aristocratique. 
Le mouvement est donc anti-autoritaire. Puis il s'en prend avec la grève générale aux conditions de vie et de travail. Il est social. Il s'en prend au patronat et il tente à l'usine d'échapper à l'arbitraire de la hiérarchie incompétente et à l'assujettissement syndical. C'est l'insubordination ouvrière. À la maison, il secoue le modèle familial. Il remet en cause le modèle sexuel. Il ouvre la voie au mouvement de libération des femmes qui s'épanouira pleinement à l'automne 69. Hein The, the text was behind, and I think they are working on it. I apologize, but I'm not sure what the... I'm sorry? Yeah, no, I, I realize that, and which is why. But I'm not sure what the current status is. Okay, shall, shall we pause until it's... Well... I can, I can try to do it in English if you... But uh, one, it was cut here? Do I have to go back? No, I think... Just go a little, a little back if you can. Yes. Thank you. Yes, I tried. Yes. My English is not improving day after day, but... Uh, <laughs> Thank anyway, you. I'll try. Thank you. We have the text. Do you want the text in English? Yes, if you want. Yeah. But uh, where do I start? Because I, I didn't... I'm not... Uh, oh, no, no. I, 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 <laughs> no? I go with it. Where do I start? Just, yeah. I think I would just go... Sorry? Anywhere, I would just go back a, a little. Exactly. The, the three demands of the movement. I think the, the, these demands were simple, yeah. and they could unite quite a lot of people. The, the one who, who were in the streets as demonstrators, of course. Thank you. Um, uh, but also. Any, anyone that could listen to it and hear what, what we were demanding. We were demanding that uh, the demonstrators to, to be, who had been arrested and who included quite a lot of young workers as well as students should be freed. We demanded that the uh, Sorbonne should be reopened and we want we, we demanded that a, a large debate of uh, what should be the future of university would start. So, uh, th this movement defines itself day after day and uh, uh, chooses its goals for the next morning in the night before. And, uh, it's true for the, the university story part of the movement, the beginning of the movement, but it's also true for the social part of the, of, or the workers part of the movement, because the general strike won't be declared or called by any union. It's, it's, so it's meaningless to uh, try to say that the movement had a, politic, a precise political uh, orientation or goals that, should, that would have been defined prior to the movement. Its existence and acts are speaking for it and they define it. When the political power had to go back, backward, and to accept quite a lot of things uh, that then make a breach in which a, a large cultural and social movement is going to to install itself and take the principal place 
after they discovered that the, the political power was weak. And uh, day after day, the, the, the way the movement is going is revealing and, pre and precising itself. The movement is against the old university and what we call the Mandarina. And uh, it's anti-authoritarian. Then, with a general strike, it's uh, taken to account the conditions of life and work of the working class, so it's social. Then it's against the leadership in the in the uh, in, in the factories. So it is, uh, and inside the factories, the movement tried to escape the uh, hierarchy, which is not competent, and uh, also. Uh, that then means that uh, a kind of insubordination, uh, a refuse of uh, uh, insubordination ouvrière, uh, what you would say, submission, the the the. the it, it was not, it, it's the opposite of the, 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 the refuse of the, 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 the refuse of that. At home, it shakes the family model. It's, uh, it, it also shakes uh, the, the sexual model of, uh, of the family and uh, the relationship between men and women. It opens the way to the women's leap that will explode in the, at the autumn of '69 in France. It's a, a movement of the whole society, and uh, the the society it itself takes the movement for 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 herself without any mediation, political or without the need of going through a political or, uh, or unionist uh, way of seeing things. Far from the university early occupied, at the corner of the streets, emptied with, with no cars, emptied of their cars because there were no more there was no more petrol uh, in the in the inside the factories people were meeting exchanging they would uh, speak about their personal familial or professional life or they would debate about their political ideas about the events about the futures they could imagine they were discussing with people they hardly knew a, a day before. And uh, people who would have no occasion to meet uh, or to be interested in the, the, uh, in the, in the, the guy they, they, they were facing would uh, discover they could be passionate because what, of what they were discovering about alterity and uh, its surprises. Town and village were not equally part of the movement, but uh, everyone, or nearly everyone, was uh, more and more captive to what was going on, and uh, they were, and people were holding their transistor at that time. There was no internet, but there were transistors. It was uh, quite impossible to be indifferent and not exchange of feelings, and uh, not at least uh, at least to start speaking of what you, what, what you were feeling. I was fully 
conscious of uh, great responsibilities, and I felt myself taken by this uh, ambiance. Uh, yes, I, I, I would not. I would not have imagined any bef before. I would not uh, imagine to to be in that kind of situation. To to be uh, in in one day, circled by uh, a forest of micros and cameras and all that. Uh, listen, my s small sister, still a girl in a, in a lycée. Uh, saying that uh, their um, companions were having my photograph with uh, the, the one of Danny and so on inside their bag. This was something very <laughs> improvisable. Because I just got word that the titles should be on track now. Yeah. Again, my apologies uh, for that not working earlier. You can continue where you are in French, yeah. if that's easier for you. And uh, the titles yes, should it, be... Uh, it's your, excellent, your English, by the way, was excellent. So, <laughs> not at all. Um, <laughs> it, it, <clears throat> I think it will be easier for the audience, but not for me. We, we can try German, Italian, <laughs> no. whatever. My, my apologies, uh, please pick it up uh, from here, ok? Yeah, Thank okay. you. Je disais juste que euh, le fait que les copines de ma sœur pouvaient avoir euh, la photo des, des trois porte-parole de mai que nous étions avec euh, Danny Cohn-Bendit et Jacques Sauvageau dans leur sac était quelque chose évidemment inimaginable. Le petit enfant juif né juste avant la guerre ne s'y attendait pas pas plus que le jeune militant engagé contre la guerre d'Algérie. Et pourtant, tout cela, c'était bien moi, même si je n'avais aucunement le temps de m'en préoccuper. Enamouré par leurs propres affects, par nos propres affects, par l'irruption de la parole et par la perception des aspirations portées par la jeunesse, ou à l'inverse, effaré et hostile face aux troubles, les Français pensaient de plus en plus qu'un vent ou un esprit révolutionnaire soufflait et les prenait dans son tourbillon. Ce sentiment partagé est pour beaucoup dans l'acceptation de l'idée que la France était en révolution. Sentiment accentué par l'agitation du pouvoir politique, un jour réprimant durement les manifestations, le lendemain libérant les manifestants arrêtés, le chef du gouvernement recevant les syndicats et leur proposant un compromis très avantageux en échange d'un arrêt des grèves. Le chef de l'État s'échappant de Paris pour se rendre parmi les troupes françaises d'occupation en Allemagne. Plus tard, mobilisant l'armée, puis la décommandant, appelant au référendum, puis aux élections législatives. Le Parti communiste français et la Confédération générale du travail courant partout en quête de la récupération de leurs troupes et surtout de leur monopole sur la classe ouvrière qu'ils croyaient acquis. Les chefs de l'opposition égarés. Il n'y avait pas que les activistes du mouvement qui tentaient de deviner le nouvel horizon qui était en train de s'imposer. Dès avant mai, le monde de Yalta se fissurait. Il en, cela emprunte des logiques propres à chaque pays, mais une importante fièvre, au-delà même des mouvements de décolonisation du tiers-monde, était montée dans plusieurs lieux, à l'ouest comme à l'est. Début 68, le printemps de Prague essayait de forcer le passage à un impossible socialisme à visage humain. Le mars polonais, le mouvement Student en Yougoslavie, chacun à sa manière, traversèrent et secouèrent le glacis soviétique. À l'ouest, le refus de l'appel sous les drapeaux des étudiants américains secoua les universités des États-Unis, comme quelques années auparavant, pendant la guerre d'Algérie, les facultés françaises. En Italie, les universités bouillaient tellement que des chars duraient être postés en février 68 devant l'université de Rome. En Espagne franquiste même, les étudiants donnaient de la voix. Mai 68 ne figurait sur aucun agenda, surtout en France. Et il est banal mais inexact d'énoncer que le mouvement a éclaté dans un ciel qui apparaissait serein et de citer le fameux éditorial du Monde, il vient d'être cité, 
du 15 mars 68. À quelques jours du surgissement en pleine rue de la contestation, le journal de référence évoquait une France qui s'ennuie. Bientôt, le, le monde modifiera le titre de sa rubrique qui passera d'agitation étudiante à contestation. Les rapports des préfets, comme l'ouverture partielle des archives le montre désormais, n'attendaient rien de particulier en France pour l'année 68. Le mai français a déboulé sans prévenir. Il serait plus juste de dire que ces signes avant-coureurs n'avaient guère été décryptés. Qui aurait attendu un parallèle ou un écho français au printemps de Prague et à sa quête de liberté, ou à la révolte des étudiants de Berkeley contre l'appel sous les drapeaux, ou aux irruptions plus précoces de la Zenga Turenne dans les rues de Tokyo Dans la France gaulliste, ne vivions-nous pas en démocratie au contraire des Tchécoslovaques et en paix au contraire des États-Unis Et en plus, dans les domaines concernés par les contestations, le gouvernement du général de Gaulle se désolidarisait de la guerre au Vietnam tout en se distanciant du glacis soviétique. Rien à voir. Ces mobilisations présentaient pour l'essentiel des similitudes autant que des différences considérables. Similitudes culturelles, différences sociales. La révolte de Berkeley ne résonnait guère dans les masses afro-américaines rassemblées par le pasteur Martin Luther King. La tentative de construction d'un socialisme à visage humain des Tchèques de Dubček perturbait fortement, certes, la mouvance communiste partout dans le monde, en touchant les fidèles comme les oppositionnels, mais elle était fort peu présente pour le plus grand nombre des contestataires français de mai, jusqu'à l'invasion, en tout cas, en août, de la Tchécoslovaquie par les troupes du pacte de Varsovie. Le mouvement, dans ses profondeurs, ressentait, ressentait plus intensément la guerre du Vietnam, dont l'issue est la retraite humiliante des Américains sous négociée à Paris ce mois-là. Elle faisait écho à l'encore récente guerre française d'Algérie et de manière plus lointaine à la précédente guerre d'Indochine de l'armée française. Avant mai dans le monde, près d'un quart de siècle après la Seconde Guerre mondiale et les accords de Yalta, les plaques tectoniques dont le mouvement et les heurts avaient ravagé le monde avant de le structurer pouvaient sembler quasiment fichées. Le monopole et la responsabilité des changements majeurs sur les équilibres de nos sociétés paraissaient paraître dévolus au seul mouvement de décolonisation représenté par le tiers-mondisme, comme on le nommait alors. Un monde de l'après-guerre, ramené aux puissances de la Seconde Guerre mondiale, comme si elles exprimaient encore la totalité des potentialités de la planète, léchait ses plaies et avait repris son évolution au pas comme si l'échec des immenses soubresauts de l'avant-guerre l'avait vacciné contre les aspirations extrêmes. L'utopie fasciste avait été vaincue dans le sang et la honte. Le communisme post-stalinien épuisait son attractivité à un rythme de plus en plus rapide au fur et à mesure que se révélait son impuissance à concilier son modèle, même ravalé par Khrushchev, avec le bien-être et la liberté. Pourtant, la guerre froide battait toujours son plein et surdéterminait l'essentiel des comportements politiques dans le monde. Avec l'effondrement des colonies et des empires, britanniques puis françaises, et la défaite programmée à très court terme des États-Unis au Vietnam, l'idée que le vent d'Est l'emportait sur le vent d'Ouest était communément admise, en sous-estimant copieusement les premiers signes de fracture du mouvement communiste. Mais l'hypothèse qu'une contestation devenant globale et radicale, endogène, puisse survenir en Occident apparaissait fort peu probable. En France, dans les décennies qui précédaient mai 68, très peu nombreux étaient les futurs protagonistes qui imaginaient, qui rêvaient ou qui craignaient un mouvement révolutionnaire endogène en France ou en Europe. Les plus portés à vouloir concrétiser eux-mêmes leur état d'esprit révolutionnaire et leur désir de révolution étaient partis en Amérique latine sur les pas de Che Guevara comme Régis Debray et une Infime poignée de militants jeunes et lassés de l'immobilisme du PCF, confie dans ses certitudes et son alignement, envisageait de le rejoindre dans les maquis de Bolivie. En revanche, une conception très vivace en France à l'époque était ancrée dans l'idée qu'en dernière instance, tout est politique et que tout peut trouver dans un renversement gouvernemental une issue. La dernière tentative révolutionnaire, ou plutôt contre-révolutionnaire, menée par l'organisation armée secrète, avait échoué face à un rejet populaire massif.
a little fur further. A little further. Yes, a little further. I think we're almost there, right? Yes. Yes. I think we Can we start from here? Yes. Okay, thank you. La France, celle des statisticiens et des gens de pouvoir, allait bien. Les Français allaient beaucoup moins bien. En 1967, les mouvements de grève avaient connu une ampleur exceptionnelle. Elles furent les plus nombreuses depuis 1936. Leur forme prenait un tour de plus en plus radical. Usines occupées pour de longues périodes, comme à la Rodia Seta à Lyon. Elles s'accompagnèrent de manifestations de rue et d'affrontements violents avec des barricades à Redon au Mans et de chocs frénétiques accompagnés à Lyon et au Mans, de très de véhémentes invectives proférées à l'encontre des CRS. CRS, SS était un mot d'ordre qui était repris des grandes grèves des mineurs de 1948. Maintenant, on a trouvé ensuite la pensée anti-68 qui a voulu liquider mais un ancien communiste, historien respecté, François Furet, a entrepris à la fin de 70 de revisiter la Révolution française, celle de 1789, ce qui l'a conduit à la diaboliser alors qu'elle était perçue comme l'intouchable source de la démocratie et de la République, enseignée comme telle à l'école et seulement mise en cause par l'affiliation royaliste et la partie la plus traditionnelle de l'Église catholique. La pensée 68 est le titre d'un ouvrage de Luc Ferry, futur ministre de l'Éducation de Sarkozy, et Alain Renaud, et elle a fourni à Nicolas Sarkozy une base à prétention théorique pour fonder son discours de campagne présidentielle d'avril 2007. 68 serait à l'origine du relativisme intellectuel, concept repris de Benoît XIII, invoqué pour nourrir un bréviaire haineux qui impute à ce démon de 68 l'origine de toutes les misères qui depuis lors frappaient, affirmait-il, la société française. Sarkozy, en recherche de la récupération de l'électorat le plus ré réactionnaire, ne se privait pas d'imputer à 68 en vrac tout. La fin de l'autorité, de la politesse, du respect, du sacré, de l'admirable, de la règle, de la norme, de l'interdit. Sans crainte du ridicule, il, att il attribuait à 68 l'introduction du cynisme dans la société et dans la politique. La montée du culte de l'argent roi, du profit à court terme et même des dérives du capitalisme financier. Tout cela du fait de la contestation réputée 68 tarde de tous les repères éthiques, de toutes les valeurs morales du capitalisme et préparant ainsi le terrain à un capitalisme sans scrupules, sans éthique, avec des parachutes en or, des retraites chapeaux, des patrons voyous. Enfin, il imputait à 68 le triomphe du prédateur sur l'entrepreneur, du spéculateur sur le travailleur. Donc 40 ans après, pour la droite bien pensante française, L'esprit de 68 vivait toujours. Dix ans plus tard, cette vision apocalyptique persiste. Ce repoussoir fictif véhicule tous les péchés du monde. Il est pour eux l'homologue de ce qu'était la gueuse pour les nervis d'action française qui accablait la République de tous les maux dans les années 30. Comme pour eux, il est utile de liquider ce mal qui subvertit tout. En réalité, mai a été approprié. À l'origine, les militants, les acteurs de mai avaient une profonde hantise, une crainte de la récupération, une peur que le vieux monde, avec ses organisations politiques, syndicales, étatiques et ses vieilles structures, ne s'empare des productions et des aspirations du mouvement pour les ensevelir et les dénaturer. Dans la période qui a suivi immédiatement la phase culminante du mouvement, beaucoup ont cherché à organiser une suite politique à mai. J'en ai fait partie pendant près de quatre ans, incluant 18 mois de prison. L'idéologie, toujours baignée de marxisme et de référence à la révolution d'octobre, a dominé la lecture de ces militants qui s'y sont noyés. Du côté des militantismes politiques, mais n'a pas porté les fruits attendus. Il faut les chercher dans la société et dans toutes ses composantes. On les y trouve. Aujourd'hui, il est absolument perceptible que ce ne sont pas ces vieilleries idéologiques qui peuvent porter à leur actif un quelconque hold-up de l'esprit de mai. Celui-ci, cet esprit de mai, continue à se métaboliser au sein de la société. Et même si des questions soulevées restent alors prégnantes, encore aujourd'hui, 
C'est le signe, la puissance persistante des insatisfactions qui se sont révélées et qui ont jailli à l'époque. En tout cas, et une fois avéré l'échec patent des liquidateurs de l'esprit de mai comme celui des récupérateurs politiciens, c'est bel et bien la société dans son ensemble qui s'est emparée de mai avec l'ensemble des sujets qu'elle a englobés, de la condition des femmes à la situation des travailleurs immigrés, à la définition de la jeunesse, au rapport entre le travail manuel et le travail intellectuel ou au risque professionnel. La société se l'est appropriée et pour répondre à la question initiale que vous m'avez posée sur l'esprit de mai, c'est bien là que je pense que son écho vit toujours. Et l'Europe, me direz-vous La construction européenne est absente de ce qui précède comme elle l'était des préoccupations et des débats des contestataires de l'époque. Et pas seulement des contestataires. En France, on se souvient du général de Gaulle s'exclamant à propos de la défense européenne en 1965 Bien entendu, on peut sauter sur sa chaise comme un cabri en disant « l'Europe, l'Europe, l'Europe », mais cela, cela n'aboutit à rien et cela ne signifie rien. L'Europe d'alors est bien présente pourtant en arrière-fond de la situation. La raison à mes yeux de cette myopie réside dans le fait qu'on s'est vite habitué à l'Ouest à engranger l'existence de cet espace de paix et de progrès construit par étapes au lendemain de la Seconde Guerre mondiale. Cette représentation ne permet pas encore de percevoir l'intensité de l'envie qu'elle suscite à l'Est et qui ira jusqu'à contribuer à la remise en cause de l'édification du bloc de l'Est sous domination soviétique. Les frontières dessinées à Yalta semblaient inébranlables, sauf à accepter l'idée d'une guerre à l'issue de surcroît incertaine et potentiellement tragique dans un univers nucléaire. Et pourtant, les murs sont tombés. L'Europe n'est pas au mieux de sa forme, Pourtant, elle est toujours capable d'empêcher de dormir ceux qui craignent l'attraction que représentent la démocratie et la paix qui y règnent pour ceux qui en sont privés. Raison de plus pour, comme vous, travailler à la réenchanter. Aujourd'hui, l'esprit de mai appartient à tout le monde, sans héritier privilégié. Et les peuples européens en disposent, les activistes européens comme les contestataires du mode de développement de l'Union. Merci. Thank you. Please sit down. Thank you very much. Again, apologies for the hassle with the title, uh, which was obviously just a piece of performance art to recreate the chaos of 1968. Um, it was all part of the plan. Roy Janssen, can you join us on stage as well? Uh, we'll we'll reshuffle a little bit um, because of the time, but you come back. I hope so. Will he sit here? Uh, you can sit here, okay. and Mr. Geismar can sit over there. Um, we'll go to a question or two from the audience in a second, but first, Rul, you have a question for Mr. Geismar yourself. I have many questions. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like... One. Only one? Yeah. Maybe, maybe two, depends okay. on the length. Um, I'll do two, if you don't mind. Well, first of all, I would uh, like to re recommend you on your, on your excellent political analysis. You have not lost anything as far as that's concerned from 50 years ago, making very clearly that it's not only for fun and revolution, what have you, but you have to be very clear politically as well what's happened. So, two questions. Well, well then I'll ask two. And we have to talk about the French Communists and the CGT. You said in your presentation that um, it was not the CGT that called the general strike. Yes. But how, um, who called the general strike? And then may, maybe just go on f on that same subject. Um, do you consider that the communists betrayed the student revolution and the student movement? I think it's on. It's, okay. it's not working? No, his, this one should work. Does it work? Well, now this one should work. Yeah. Yes. Okay. It, it's, it's obvious that uh, the general Mine is working. has not been called by any, any union. Uh, it took them nearly three weeks to make a general call. So. That's fact, but only fact. And uh, also, the, the CP couldn't, couldn't accept the idea of a, a general mass revolutionary movement because I, I, told, I told you, I told you it had, uh, a lot of people were thinking it was revolutionary. 
So they, they, they were facing a revolutionary movement that, that, didn't, that they, 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 couldn't, they couldn't manage with it. It was out of them. It was something that came from even people who didn't like them. And uh, uh, for a communist to be, uh, to, to lose the authority it's supposed to have on the working class is something unbelievable. So they, they are, in a way, obliged to fight against it. So they joined because, the party, so to speak. Yes. They, they, from the very beginning, they, they have uh, they, they have fought the move against the, the mm -hmm. movement. They said it was a counter-revolutionary movement. Mm. They said that uh, uh, Danny Cohn-Bendit was a German anarchist. And uh, that was an insult at this time, both as to be German and to be anarchist, yeah. in their spirit, yeah. <laughs> in the way they, they did. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, mm -hmm. You are free. You are free to be that. No problem. What? What? Mm -hmm. What are the big? What is the one big misunderstanding about 1968? Everybody looks back now, 50 years later. Um, some come to the conclusion that in the end it, it all failed. Some say that it was the beginning of a, of, of even more. What's the biggest misconception? Well, if, if they want to say that uh, 68 didn't become, uh, th there's no, there, there's no, there was not a political victory at the end of 68. And the uh, general election that followed 68 was a, a big win for the right, uh, the goal, the goal and the, the, the rightist uh, movement. So, Sorry, one, 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 one second, please. We'll get to an audience question in a second. Go on. And, uh, if, if, it, if it's this kind of political, uh, of political lecture, uh, of course it's a failure. Mm -hmm. uh, if you see uh, 68 not like uh, exactly a political movement, but for, um, for as a movement inside the society, it's something very different. Mm -hmm. the, the, the opposition is between the people, I think, is between the people that are strictly trying to look only the political result, the immediate political result of 68, and the people who, look, uh, who try to look what 68 has changed inside the society. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you may like or, do, or not like the way the society has uh, moved from 68. If you don't like it, you can say 68 is a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. If you like it, uh, you, will th you will think that it was not that bad. Far from it. Mm. Keep it brief, your one yes, question um, for him. Um, how do you look back at your personal uh, political uh, odyssey, so to speak? You were the activist of the um, Teachers' Union, a Maoist at the time. You were involved uh, with the, the Gauche Proletarienne. Uh, you even got into jail, as you said. And now you uh, support Europe, the European Union, and you're in favor of uh, President Macron. Macron. Uh, how uh, can you enlighten us about your, this political uh, well, t t t journey? Okay. journey? At the very beginning of May 68, I was not a Maoist. Uh -huh. I was uh, left social democrat in a way. I've been an activist during Algerian war against Algerian war in favor of the independence of Algeria, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I was uh, I had no membership of any party mm -hmm. in '68. Mm -hmm. I was a member of my union and general secretary. And uh, we, we represented a third of uh, academics in, in France, 
That means uh, you can't think that a third of the academics in France were Maoist or mm -hmm. don't know what. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. It's nonsense. Uh, I've been elected with a text that said that we, we were um, in favor of a small cultural revolution inside French university. Small is important. <laughs> if you mm -hmm. want. And uh, when 68 start to decline, the, the movement, it was quite unbearable to think, for a guy like me, to think that things would uh, go business as usual and everything would uh, work as if 68 had not existed. So I get involved in a revolutionary movement, uh, uh, the, the Maoist movement at, mm -hmm. at that time, and I, uh, I stood there for about four years, and uh, mm -hmm. that's it. Mm -hmm. And uh, nowadays, uh, nowadays, I can say that uh, if you ask me about uh, Mac the Macron, Macron, or yeah. Macron, I must say I'm, I'm glad that uh, Macron has uh, the, the, the existence of the Macron uh, candidate as a candidate. Uh, if not, we would have to choose between Le Pen and the Fillon. And it was an impossible choice. So I'm glad he came. I voted for him. And I hope it, he will succeed in a way. I'm not, I'm not in agreement with everything he does. Yeah. Far from it. But I think that uh, we, if, if, if it fails, if he fails, uh, we'll, have the, we, we'll have again an impossible choice between extremes. Mm. And that's, that's it. Okay, thank we'll, you. We'll thank have you. to leave it here. Before we go to the younger generation, um, um, you all waited so long, so I can. Uh, we have time for one question from the audience. A question meaning uh, a sentence with a question mark, so not a long essay. You can send that to the op ed pages of the, any newspaper. Is there one question um, for this gentleman from the audience already? We'll get to more later. Yeah, the gentleman over there. Sorry, I think you need a mic. Uh, hello. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, right now in Paris there are uh, occupations happening again at uh, multiple uni universities uh, here in Amsterdam or actually all over the Netherlands. It's brewing again in, uh, in the universities, um, mainly due to the, like, the control of state and market on uh, the university curriculum. So I'm wondering, um, I wanted to ask your opinion about the university as a place for uh, critical reflection uh, within society and its function as such. Thank you. It's sure that uh, university and more of that intelligence is a critical role to play in society. That's, no discussion for me in this, but there are many other <coughs> objectives of what a university can, is compelled to do in a society. And uh, you can't resume the, the, the function of university in its uh, uh, critical, uh, uh, the critical part it has to play. It's, uh, it's also something but that it's also university is also something who should provide you progress in science uh, in uh, history lecture and uh, so many uh, arts uh, so many so many things that uh, you can I refuse to look at university as a unique uh, uh, unique uh, part of it, which is uh, the critical part of it, uh, it has to play. But, but it, it, it doesn't mean it's not important. Right, right. It's just not the whole story. We, we'll go to the younger generation. We have three young 
thinkers, activists of today with us. We asked them to think about that sentence, what if, uh, as well. Um, and we'll expand on that a little bit. A vision for the future and the lessons of uh, 68. No, you can stay here. You can both say, okay. sorry, I should have said. You can both stay here and, and, and listen and then um, uh, maybe <laughs> discuss, because maybe you completely disagree with our next yes. three people are going to say, and we're going to start. I it was time for the young to be in front. Well, the, <laughs> the young can stand over there, <laughs> and then they, they can sit. Um, let's start with Alicia Gashinka. She's a, um, a Belgian-Polish philosopher with a focus on the concept of freedom, um, and she'll talk about her ideas about 1968. The light is just too bright. You're right here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have written something, a lesson from 68. If we stop looking back on the past, we will stop learning from it. And if we stop learning from the past, we won't have a future. It is good to pause and reflect about where we come from and where we are now. But if we romanticize the past, we will fail to learn proper lessons of it. 1968 is said to be the year where everything seemed possible, the year that freedom reigned, the year that imagination took power. Such a glorification of 1968 annoys me. It really does. Because what exactly are we talking about? Which 1968? That of Prague? That of Paris? That of Mexico, where students were kidnapped, tortured by the government? Or maybe that of Memphis, where Martin Luther King was shot dead. Poland has been mentioned already twice, and I also want to talk a little bit longer about Poland. In March 1968, students, intellectuals, and those longing for real liberties took part in major protests against the communist government. The government didn't merely re respond by crushing the dissident movement, it also adopted an anti-Semitic measures that have no parallel in post-war European history. It is estimated that between 13,000 and 30,000 Jews and non-Jewish intellectuals and dissidents were forced into exile. Our collective memory is strikingly selective when it comes to 1968. Let's not forget, 50 years onwards, all those thousands of lives that were at best disrupted, at worst destroyed by anti-Semitic communists. The glorification of 1968 may not blind us for such historic evil. Neither may it lead us into temptation of easy conclusions and simply solutions. Simple solutions. There is absolutely no reason to believe that the past contains the simple solutions to the complex problems we face today. Yet many believe we need to reconnect to the ideals of the Soissons Vitaire, in particular to their famous creed, Imagination ou Pouvoir. I would argue, however, if there is one thing politics and the world needs nowadays and our future, it is a proper sense of reality, rather than more imagination. It is important to keep in mind that imagination is not a good in itself. Evil people can be highly inventive and imaginative. All over the world, there are people in power who are quite imaginative and the result are doing things that defy all imagination. They imagine you solve a problem by simply building a wall around it. They imagine real facts can be replaced by alternative truths. They imagine elections can be manipulated without anyone noticing it. They imagine climate change to be a product of scientists suffering from too much imagination. And so on. In face of this, common sense stands out as an indispensable virtue of a good politician and an engaged citizen. Common sense is the compass without all imagination is aimless. If there is one important lesson to be learned from 1968, it is this. As citizens, we are not powerless puppets on a string. 
Each citizen can be a political actor and can make, make his voice heard. This lesson is, an important, is as important today as ever. We are faced today with problems on a huge, huge scale. Climate change, structural geopolitical conflicts and injustices that cause violence, migrations, racism. And often you hear, what can a single individual do when we are so small and the problems of the world are so big? Well, I believe we can make a difference and we can demand change. And when we know we can make the difference, we should know we have to make a difference. They asked me to end this with a what if. So my what if is, what if we teach that exact lesson to all the citizens? The lesson that active citizenship is not merely a possibility, it is a moral duty. Thank you. You can actually sit here. We'll, we'll, we'll shuffle uh, chairs. Alicia Kaczynska, thank you uh, so much. A brief um, a remark from you, perhaps. We're glorifying 1968 a bit too much. Yes, of course. Yeah, <laughs> you agree. That's good. If you, if you put 68 so high, mm -hmm. uh, it's something, it's impossible to, to you, you can't move if you have something too high up on your head. So you have to put 68 at its right place. Mm -hmm. And as I said, what I think deeply, it's inside the society, it's not something on top. Very clear, okay. Thank you. Let's go to our next, uh, well, I, uh, the, the next representative of the younger uh, generation, Thomas de Creus. He's a Belgian journalist and the author of the book, This is Tomorrow. Thomas, thank you. Uh, hello, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I often have uh, discussions with uh, an older colleague of mine, someone, uh, he was an activist or some kind of activist during the 70s, and we often discuss the, the differences between now and the 70s. I consider myself too as kind of a journalist activist, or at least that's what I'm called often so. Um, and he says one of the main differences is that in my time, so in the 60s and 70s, we still had the horizon that things would be better in the end that we have some kind of better future, that society was transforming into something better, and it gave us courage. Um, and I think this is a huge difference with today, with how younger people think today. Of course, it's, it's very difficult to speak in the name of the youth, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to speak in the name of myself and some people I know and the things I see around me. And what I see around me is that a lot of young people, even those who are activists and who are engaged, um, who take part in manifestations and so on, are actually very pessimistic. Um, and I think they're right. Uh, I think we have all reason to be very pessimistic, and maybe we're not even pessimistic enough. Um, to just sum up um, some things, uh, I think it's, it's, it's obviously clear today that we are well, ruled by madmen. I mean, I don't have to mention Donald Trump and all the rest of his followers and, and fans and, and the Erdogans and the Putins and so on. Uh, it's clear also that even in, in, in Western Europe, uh, not to say the United States, democracies are sold. I mean, democracies have become some kind of huge popular marketing machines. That's it. I mean, it has nothing to do with democracy itself. Our social welfare is also sold, uh, is uh, dismantled. Um, you have a huge rise of, uh, of racism, of xenophobia, of Islamophobia, and you wonder where it's going to end. I mean, if you build up the hate, it's going to end somewhere. I mean, it's not going to evaporate like that. Um, not to mention the borders of Europe, where we have camps again, um, in Greece and Italy, not to mention Libya, Sudan, and so on, where we actually fund camps in order to detain migrants over there and just to let them rot away. Uh, it's not often in the news, but it's what's happening. Uh, and also, we let thousands of people just drown in the Mediterranean Sea and act as if nothing is 
uh, going on. And of course, uh, it was already also mentioned, we have the, the whole ecological catastrophe which is uh, coming at us, which is already happening. Um, we can't stress enough the, the severeness of, of this um, ecological disaster. And I think whether you're on the left or on the right or in the center, we all know that continuing the way we run our society today, if you continue this for the next 100 years, it's going to be a complete disaster. We know, we all know that we can go on like this, the way we, we run society as we do now. We all know that. It's, it's a fact. Um, and so I think today, uh, transforming society, um, revolt, insurrection, is maybe not chasing utopia, it's, it's actually more a matter of survival, I think. Uh, we need another type of society, we need to transform society, not to create utopia, but in order to save uh, maybe what, what makes us um, human, even. Um, so, my what if would be, uh, what, if, uh, what if revolution is not some kind of chasing a dream, but just, uh, just being able to survive in the 21st century. Um, and I think this is indeed the case. Uh, one of my favorite philosophers, Walter Benjamin, um, made a distinction more implicit uh, between a revolution as something which, in which you conquer utopia, a revolution as a kind of emergency break, like stopping the contemporary order before it's too late, stopping the train before he crashes into the wall. And I'm much in favor of this second uh, interpretation of revolution. I think this is the kind of revolution or transformation, you can call it whatever you want, that we need today. And I think that's also, if young people are in the streets, it's because of that kind of feeling not because they believe in some kind of communist <clears throat> utopia. No, no, they feel that they, they cannot go on like this, and we cannot go on like this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> you can sit over here. Um, well, that was a very <laughs> upbeat uh, look at the near future. It's almost weekend. Um, We'll talk about the, 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 the revolution that's needed, according to you, in uh, a second. But first, the third of our younger generation, yes, Flavia Kleiner, is here. Uh, she's a Swiss student and activist and the face of Operation Libero, which stood up against the far right in Switzerland, the Swiss People's Party, which was eventually defeated at the polls. Uh, the same question for her. What if? Flavia Kleiner. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to speak to you, and I will make it very quick so we have more time for discussion. Um, when I think of 68 on the one hand, and then to be here in Amsterdam in 2018, and we speak about Act for Democracy, um, what, I, what came to my mind is that in 68, basically, it was about fighting for freedom. And I think today, in 2018, it's about defending freedom, to put it in a really basic level. And sometimes here I find myself as a bit of a like, <coughs> conservative even. I mean, I'm defending the status quo as a young person. Sometimes it's a bit absurd to me, but uh, still I'm doing it uh, by fighting actually and defending um, institutions, rule of law, basic values of respect of human beings uh, in migration crisis times, and so on. And then, yeah, I mean, in Switzerland, what we try still to present is not only to like, fight against these initiatives of right-wing populists, but also to somehow present a positive vision of the future. We want to see uh, Switzerland in the year 2050, where we live with our families and good jobs in a country uh, which is prosperous and, and open, and thanks to that. And we see Switzerland, that's how we claimed it when we launched our organization four years ago. We said Switzerland is the land of opportunities in the 21st century, and it's not this kind of free air museum uh, where nothing is supposed to change ever. So that's what we do in Switzerland, and I'm happy to speak more about it. 
But maybe this more what if case, what I really liked about the 68 uh, revolutions, it was this energy. I think this energy that was spreading through the streets and that created this transnational movement. And here, I really wonder when this movement uh, for fighting for freedoms in the tradition of 68 and defending freedoms will somehow reach the Western world, which is now threatened on the writing populist movements, and when this fight back will start and become a real transnational movement. This inspired me very much by listening also to Alain Gesmar. And maybe this one question that always um, bothers me a lot. Um, I think there was a big democratic moment after World War I, and there was a really big democratic moment after World War II. And we founded the European Union, and still it's, ex it's existing today. And there was a third big democratic movement, which is, I'd say, the 68 revolution. And there was another one after the end of the Cold War. And sometimes I'm asking myself, how can we create a new democratic movement and momentum um, without any wars going on before, for example. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> you can sit. <laughs> Rul, you're, you're still a young man, so I, or you can stand over there, but let, let all our guests. <laughs> um, and you have a microphone, so you're in charge of your own. Um, you can just jump in and interfere. Uh, let, let's talk about all this briefly, or at least at least touch upon some things. Um, you, Thomas, are talking about about uh, a new revolution. Um, uh, you talked about um, why you're basically hopeful that after the, the period we're in right now, um, uh, something may come up. My, my question is, how how do you do it? In '68, the students and the trade unions connected. There were 10 million. French on the streets. Today, the society seems more individualized, more compartmentalized. How do you get all these different groups together? And uh, is it more of a challenge than it was in the 60s? Does anybody have, a, have an idea on that? Because we are living in a more individualized society, or am, am I wrong? Solve this. Solve it. <laughs> now, for me, basically, the, the most important thing that we try to do is to show people why it matters to them individually. So, for example, if uh, in Switzerland we had, we had this uh, vote two years ago, which was on the expulsion of criminal foreigners. That's how they called it, the writing populists. And even for like minor offenses of criminal law. So, if you as a Dutch guy would drive two times too fast, within 10 years in Switzerland, this law would have made you being expelled out of the country. So even if your family lived there and you had kids, or maybe you had this Dutch passport, but you've never lived in Holland ever, um, which is really probable because 25% of the inhabitants of Switzerland are um, foreigners and they have sometimes backgrounds from further generations back uh, abroad. And so it was really tricky to make the Swiss voters understand that this is a vote actually about their rights, in a sense. It's about our constitution, and it's about how we want to live together in this country. And that's why it, ma it matters to them as well, individually. And that was really important to show. It's not just to vote on criminal foreigners, uh, because then it... Of course, you would you would agree because you just know. address people's own exactly. needs and interests as as focused as you can. Yes, and in that in a broader sense, then also to show like a constitution that's the fundament of the society, mm -hmm. right? The legal fundament. So this matters to everybody, and right. I think. That's Thomas, you talked about about a, a new revolution and how that that was needed, but you didn't describe how how that would look and how that comes about. What what's beyond it being necessary, what is your recipe? Uh, but and to I'll be clear, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, holding a plea for like the revolution because I don't believe in that. I think that's totally implausible today also, uh, this classic notion of, of, of a communist Marxist revolution. Uh, but I did call for uh, what you could 
could say a radical transformation of society, which is sort of something different. <laughs> right. It doesn't have this, this heavy connotation. But how but can I, you make that more specific? Uh, how do you reach this? Mm -hmm. That's the question. Uh, well, this or is even begin. The, yeah. uh, well, you know, maybe in the low countries it's, it's quite peaceful, but in other countries it's, it's not that peaceful. Uh, if, if you look at France, for example, since 2016, it's, it's, uh, you have a lot of protests. Uh, if you look at Spain, at Greece also. And I think one of the things today is indeed you don't have these this spontaneous collectives anymore. I mean, we are indeed more individualized and so on. But protest itself is in a very important way in order to make new connections. And what you see, for example, I, I've been quite a lot in France uh, since 2016, and what I saw there in the streets was quite fascinating in the sense that people reconnect in the streets during the protests, protests themselves and create new collectivities in, in that way. Um, that's, this, this was also the case, for example, with Occupy, with the Occupy movement. I mean, people occupied squares, and in occupying the square, they created new collectivities, which, um, which could trigger further protests. Uh, of course, in, in the Western world, <laughs> uh, it kind of faded away, although people like Bernie Sanders still are in that wave of Occupy, so it had a political translation. But of course, in the Arab world, it really led to, uh, to revolutions. And, um, yeah, but look at where the Arab world stands right yeah, now. Yeah, but that, that's, that's, that's revolution. I mean, Napoleon also came 20 years after, uh, after 1789. I mean, that's, it's, it's always a chaotic period. Uh, you never know where you're going to end. Uh, mm -hmm. But they did, at one point, overthrow uh, authoritarian regimes. So it's still possible in the 21st century. I mean, you're just with one million people on the square, and Mubarak was gone. I mean, it happened. And of course, I mean, we will see where we end. But of course, things don't look nice at the moment. That's true. Now, now the political right in, um, in Europe and, and, and the far right, they use 68 as a favorite punching bag, right? They, they point at the yes. baby boomers and, and uh, they, they bring up 68 every time they feel it's needed. Did 68 create um, is, is 68 partly the breeding ground for this new radical right movement uh, in the Netherlands? Um, what is your take? The I don't hold you personally responsible for anything. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it sounded like that, but I don't. Well, if you want to, it's not, not a problem for me. Uh, <laughs> you can take me on. Uh, I can survive. Um, no, I think if they, if they had no 68, they would find something else. Mm -hmm. uh, in the 30s, the, it was after the, they were bashing the French Revolution of 1789, La Gueuse. Right. La, la République, c'était La Gueuse. Elle était, uh, the Republic was the source of everything that didn't work, and they wanted <laughs> the, the, a king to, to come back. Mm -hmm. Well, you have a king here, it's, it's something else. <laughs> He's still uh, here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, this was, they, they, they have to have the bad object somewhere. Mm -hmm. And they, they, if they had not 68, I think they would take something else. What, what, what have you seen in Europe over the past years uh, that was inspiring to you? The, the, the younger generation protest. Have you seen anything that gave you uh, a lot of hope? Well, I think um, maybe to escape a bit of Europe, what happened in Tunisia was very mm -hmm. enthusiastic, mm -hmm. uh, important. Uh, in 2012, was it? Yeah. Probably. Or just now? Just when they, 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 they shook everything and mm -hmm. uh, they, they have a, a constitution they, they, they arrived mm -hmm. to, to build right. a constitution with the civil rights, mm -hmm. the rights of women, a lot of things that uh, we, 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 th we would think it was impossible, impossible. to get. Well, what about so so they, they, they've been able to go over a, a big war, mm -hmm. very big war. What about Europe? Thomas mentioned Bernie Sanders in, in the US. I guess that's a clear example. What, what else have you seen in Europe that um, perhaps even reminded you a little bit of, um, of, of, of the atmosphere of back then? I wouldn't say that. I, I think Europe is uh, 
a strange object that uh, uh, is uh, walking quite slowly and sometimes like a crab. Mm -hmm. It uh, it goes it goes uh, <laughs> a bit in front and then a bit back. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it's what's important. What's to me very interesting in Europe if, is it's still living. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was not obvious when the, 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 the French and Germans, just after the war, started something that it would be still living uh, so, so, so long and, and, and would be strong enough to be a model that destroyed the, the Soviet system, for instance. It's mm. something amazing. Mm. I think I don't know if even they they would have dreamed of that. That's right. Sometimes we're too. Um, um, we should appreciate. Look, 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 for instance, when I was a advisor of the Minister of uh, European Affairs in Paris, mm -hmm. it was a time was a. The, there was a, a bill of rights being discussed in Europe against in, in, inside the ministers of different countries, and uh, I remember a meeting with uh, the minister of Ireland saying that, uh, well, with your problem of civil rights and uh, laicity. Uh, it's very interesting, but we, we can't afford that because uh, our schools are held by the, 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 church. the church, our hospitals are held by the church and so on. So please, let us, the time, it, it <coughs> might take years and years, but we, 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 we need to be out of it because we don't want to go inside civil war again. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look the vote that occurred last week, you see the wonderful path they've made in so, so few years. Mm -hmm. That's something fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I'm grateful to, for, for mm -hmm. the, those Irish people. They, they've been able to, to do that peacefully. You're, you sound more optimistic than some of your younger <laughs> colleagues. Are they too in, in, impatient or don't know the cycle of history? Oh. <laughs> if they're not impatient, who would be? Um. Excellent. <laughs> um, let's go to a few audience questions. We're way past time, but that's okay. You know. Yeah, uh, over there. Sorry, I forgot I have to give you the microphone. <clears throat> Yeah. Thanks a lot. This is really extremely interesting. And I would like to address my question somehow to Everybody. combine the, 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 the opinion of uh, 68 generation, new young generation, so Alan and, and Thomas. And Alan said, we were so unsatisfied and we were ready to do something about this uh, unsatisfaction. And then came all what uh, happened in the 60s, what, it, what was extremely inspirational <coughs> for all others who came after, including me and my friends and all what we did. But then Thomas painted a picture which is almost nihilistic. And now you have much more tools and possibilities to do something against it than generation of 68. You live in more democratic society with more channels to do something about that. So what stopped? you and your friends and your generation to do something about all these problems which uh, look like endless, what you said in your short speech. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Yeah, since you addressed me last, I will answer, but um, <clears throat> of course I'm doing something. I mean, it, it, it's my job. Uh, so so I'm, I'm, I'm an activist. Uh, but my point is uh, that a lot of people still live... Activist. activist. Ah. My point is that, uh, <laughs> in my opinion, a lot of people in Western Europe live in some kind of weird dreamlike bubble and don't really see what is going on, for example, at the frontiers of Europe. I mean, the things I sketched are facts. I mean, they're all facts. I mean, maybe not the first point about the nutcases. I mean, we can discuss whether Trump is crazy or not, although I think he is. 
But for example, when I talk about camps at the border of Europe, they exist. I mean, but everybody knows that because it's been publicized, right? No, not everybody knows that. I mean, or everybody knows that, but doesn't mm. care. And I just want to uh, create some kind of sense of urgency. And I, I feel it, I see it with people around me that, that a lot of young people actually are not interested in politics because, because they are too depressed by it. And uh, there's a small, there's a small uh, border between like being too depressed by it and um, and political action. I mean, young people are on 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 on, on that uh, border all the time, uh, and it, that's my interpretation. Is it nihilistic? I don't think so. I mean, I'm an idealist, but uh, I think <laughs> society itself is pretty nihilistic. But if you look at what Flavia, for instance, did with her group in, in, in Switzerland, basically blocking the People's Party from, from winning the elections, that, that's a, you know, I, 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 I suspect that your supporters are, are young. I know they are. Yes. But also, are you more optimistic than, than Thomas sounds? Well, actually, we also have a really, um, I'd say, an elderly man who's an active member. He's actually fighting as an online warrior, trolls, that's what he does, and mm -hmm. he's 92 years old. 92, really? Facebook, yeah. <laughs> so, Still have a way to go. Yes, but I would, <laughs> I would also, I mean, I wonder how you, because I really like the question. I, I also see that many young people, they, they don't really engage. But I'm not sure why this is, because what is important to see is that actually we have many opportunities and we, ha we have to fear less, I at least say, in these Western European countries that we we are from um, oppression or anything. And I'm sometimes a bit um, worried also why people don't see themselves as like a change agent, really, that they can, they can change what they are disturbed by and make an offer to other people. And then maybe they join and then it's growing. And that's at least what we did. And I mean, I know Switzerland, you know, it's still it's paradise. I'm not saying this. But still, this right-wing populist party is really strong, and they are the biggest party in parliament. And all the right-wing, like also not right-wing parties, they started to overtake their discourse. They were shaping the discourse in Switzerland. They were dominating. <coughs> like, okay, this half a year we speak on minarets. Next half a year we speak about, uh, I don't know, uh, criminal foreigners. And everybody started to speak the same way like they did. And we somehow wanted to break this sovereignty that the writing populists had and we managed to do it i think uh, to a certain extent and we'll g continue that's what we do. you wanted to say something yeah um i think i am i don't like that um the questions are posed like um or the division is made between young people should mm -hmm. do something mm -hmm. and where is the rest I think we have modern technology that applies to you as well, not only to Thomas or me or because we are supposed to live longer here than older uh, people. The world is all of us. We should be just as much worried about all the challenges. Um, so I don't like that division between youngsters and older people. We have a lot of problems in Europe and we have uh, the rights is on the rise for already decades. But let's face it, uh, the Europe exists not we the youngsters are in minority. So if uh, the right is elected. It's also because the old elder you people and the older generation. So thank you. <laughs> and you, you, as, you as well should feel responsible for Europe and for the problems. And if we, if we will divide and make a division between the old and the young, <coughs> then we are not solving it, but creating new problems. I think we do it together or we can't do it. So that's the first thing that I think it's not good to look to the, to the youngsters at now in 2008 and then ask, well, what now? Save well, us. no, look to everybody. And another thing thing is that I also don't like when we look to 2018 to young people and say like they did it they were like enlightened no they weren't no I spoke with a lot of people of uh, of your generation and I'm sure you can you can and you're nodding so I hope you agree with that it's not that every single person that was standing on the street knew what what was happening uh, no, you just all. said you started the anecdote there was you, no plan. You, you went to 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 Paris you didn't even know what you were doing there you just woke up and suddenly there were protests around you <laughs> you see uh, and that, that's how we that's how we ended up there this afternoon and a lot of people uh, things like the the big things um, 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 
changes in, in society. It's not that it was planned, oh, let's do something in May 2000, uh, uh, 1968. Okay. Nobody knew that in January. Yeah. So Very things good point. happened, and, mm -hmm. and I, I believe it can happen now, but if it happens, it has to be together, not only by the young. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Thank you. <laughs> and we also, we also have to define where young ends and old begins, because mm. asking for a friend. We have Asking to have a, a young friend. spirit then. Mr. Geismar, you, yeah, like you wanted to respond to this. Yes. Uh, I, I was to say uh, what you said at the end. That a few days before May 68, nobody would think uh, that uh, the world revolution was something that would be used uh, a month later as uh, an evidence for uh, thousands of people. So it's, it's not because nowadays you can't see anything moving in, uh, and uh, taking the, sh the shape the, of, of a revolution. That doesn't mean some, no, nothing can happen. Yeah. That's that's uh, the, the that's the first thing, and uh, the the second thing I wanted to to say is uh, that uh, the young people we were at this time are now the old people that uh, uh, and that's it. <laughs> and sixty uh, eight was not only a young movement. You had people of all generations in it. In, at the beginning, it was students. That means they were young. At the very beginning. But uh, when the movement uh, explodes and uh, you have uh, 10 million people on strike, they were not all 20. Uh, far from it. And, uh, s but they recognized themselves on what was happening. That's, uh, that's it. The, it started with a uh, fact that people felt it was, at the time, something they, they thought that was impossible. They, they, they could think it, it became possible. And that, that's something uh, that happened. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, Rule, before we go to another um, mm -hmm. audience questions, perhaps yes. to, to end with, you wanted to... Yes, um, I think, uh, Alicia, what you said on the demography is very important. Dem demography is a usually underestimated <coughs> factor in social movements in general. So the shift from young, a young population with a third of the people under 22 and now maybe 10% or so, that makes a difference for the society as a whole. Um, um, you said, well, imagination, we don't need the imagina imagination, but rather common sense. But it was exactly the, f the fact that, as, as Alain just said, that it was such a surprise that all of a sudden from 300 protesters, you went to a million and to then 10 million people on strike in France for a month. That was the imagination. You couldn't, you couldn't imagine that. Yeah. So it was a sort of a new reality that was uh, coming, uh, that coming to... To, to become true. And on the other hand, you are right that lots of things were very, very tough and hard and, and sad in 1968. When I wrote my book, by every once in a while I was in tears really when I, you, you were writing about all the terrible things that happened at the same time. It was not only happiness and, and, and joy, enjoyment and what have you and you know, making fun in the streets and throwing up barricades, but it was a lot of killing in, in all over the world in different places. The repression in Poland you mentioned was terrible. Prague, of course, was a disaster, um, even though there were not that many deaths. But anyway, you know, for 10 years, 20 years, Czechoslovakia was closed. Um, Mexico, f for me personally, was the biggest uh, shock, really, to find out that about maybe a thousand people were killed and nobody ever took any responsibility for that. So also in 68, it's not only now that you can be pessimistic, but looking at that time, you know, some very, very harsh things happened. And just the last point on the, on the new right that is, uh, you know, all over the place coming up. Um, the funny thing is that they copy a lot of 
um, methods and tactics of the left, the, the old left, so to speak, of 1968. They are against the establishment. <laughs> Here it's called against the, um, the political cartel that runs the country. Mm -hmm. Trump uh, wants to swamp, uh, drain the swamp of, 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 of Washington. That's very much anti-establishment. He won't do it, but you know, those are the slogans. So in a way they copied the, 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 uh, the anti-establishment and anti-established um, um, media, for example, uh, uh, attitude that was very much alive in, in 1968. On the other hand, of course, the, their philosophy, their ideology is completely opposed to it. It's mm -hmm. exclusion versus the inclusion that was part of the 68 movement, the spirit of 68. Exactly. And I just, if I may Francis add to this, the same in the yeah, the same. Yeah. I think interestingly enough, also today we see that somehow established and like some sort of majority voices sound so loud, right? Um, in in this respect, and back then in '68, it was rather like minorities also to speak up. Mm. So this is maybe also something which is different today. Mm. Is there uh, another question? Let's take two, and then we have to end from the audience. Cannot be, yes. Uh, thanks for this discussion. Uh, I'm wondering a couple of things. Uh, one is, when we define Europe, what is exactly what we're talking about? Sorry? When we define Europe, what is with exactly what we're talking about? Because it seems that it's attributed as an homogeneous pool, let's say. Mm. So this, I think, we should take into consideration. I then the, mm. can you hear me there? Or? Yeah. Go, the go the what's second, your, what's your the question was around the the fact of uh, establishments of con councils or councilism in the in the as a political structure within the '68 movement. Councils? Yeah, councilisms like council, con concejalism. The conseil. The conseil. Yeah. Oh. And this was a crucial, crucial element of articulation, which seems to be lost, but you still, or at least is, is not too much in the discussion. And when it comes to I, the discussion... I'm, I'm not sure whether I understand, but it may yeah. be my lack of... Uh, what, what word you, you, you said? Um, like the wor workers' councils. Okay. Councils. Uh, councils. Yeah. 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 Not unions, which is a very different, no. The so Yugoslavian, unions, you say, the Yugoslavian model. Exactly, the Yugoslavian model. That uh -huh. was pretty much what, when you brought the argument of the anarchist, mm -hmm. uh, German anarchist, mm -hmm. was actually referring to that political articulation. Okay. So what's your question? So there is, I see an opportunity still there, mm -hmm. but I see also that it's being very much targeted because of the alliance that the left has to the neoliberal mm -hmm. uh, aspect of democracy. So, in that terms, I see also a correlation mm -hmm. with uh, with the on how the populist structures is. But what's your question? We need a question. <laughs> it is a discussion, so I don't okay. have a. Uh -huh. You can add okay. a question mark. Okay. And I want someone to react to this. Okay. You want something to someone to react to this? Does anybody want to react <laughs> on your first mark, uh, meaning Europe? I think we're talking about Poland and we're talking about Western Europe. I think we're talking about both Eastern and Western Europe. But. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. No, no, that, I was going to get to that. Civilianism. Do, do you have... No. No? <laughs> I'm Anybody? sorry. No, no, it's if, if... Does somebody want to respond to what this gentleman said? Yeah? Well, um, in part, in, as in a reaction on the, um, on the movements, the social movements since 1968 uh, in the Netherlands, the law on the ondernemingsrade was introduced. Uh, in the early 70s, so there was more was given to the uh, workers' councils. It was given more responsibility, and uh, that was part of the um, one of the many consequences of what happened in the years before. If that is an answer to your question, I don't know. Is there? I think the revolution is starting. <laughs> yes. <we speak. laughs> yes. If we're talking about. New tools we have, like the younger generation has, uh, and you didn't have in '68. It's obviously we're talking about digital tools. Uh, the last so-called revolution was a digital revolution. So, um, do you think the the next, if we're sitting here in 50 years, there must be oh, like lovely. at least a hacker or a programmer sitting down here? Uh, to talk about uh, new ways of uh, building a new internet, 
because at the moment uh, it's it's a problem that uh, the digital world is just uh, um, the, the same thing than the analog world, like uh, with big companies, like five big players, uh, obviously. Mm. But uh, a lot of people right now are working on a new kind of internet, like right. decentralized. Right. So yes. the question is, uh, do you believe still in the power you're of the, uh, the internet? I guess the, oh, the, you're the, engineer. the person to ask that to maybe is you, Flavia. <laughs> During your campaign, I'm sure without the internet, yeah. um, there would have been no campaign, or am I wrong? Of course, I mean, it's a really, we know this all, it's a really cheap way also to distribute your message. Um, and uh, I think this really helps to, to reach more and more people. Uh, we also, yeah, so basically this, but maybe if I may state just another point to that, because in the end still, and maybe um, you would criticize this, but to me it's a tool basically. And it might be that the tool starts to affect also the message. But I would still say priority number one, in a way, is the message and what you want to say. And, and therefore, you need to think, how do you put things um, that more and more people can understand um, what you're speaking about? Uh, in a way, I mean, I see my organization as a translation service also of what institutions are about, how, are, uh, how important rule of law is, how things are interlinked. And um, there it's clear that when you are on social media there, for example, it needs to be super short, super crisp, super funny sometimes, <laughs> even though it's a serious issue. And I'm also aware of the fact that we are in concurrence with some cat video on Facebook, right? Um, but this doesn't mean that you cannot speak about serious content, but it's more about how can you be popular? How can you um, bring out your message in a popular way? That's what I would say. And then only after, to me at least, but maybe, you know, in 15 years, some of us say, ah, oh, you were totally wrong about that point. <laughs> Right. In a radical way, in a, in, a, in, a, like in a way like 68 worked for you guys. But this, I. Maybe. Oh, you know, no, um, I don't understand. Like, like, uh, he's talking about blockchain. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, let's. let's I mean, but, good point, but let's not discuss okay. blockchain because <laughs> let's say uh, Marshall McLuhan the medium yeah. is the message uh, right the early 60s but I mean yes, the, but obviously I mean the, the fact that the internet as it is right now doesn't work and, and maybe even harms democracy even though it helps democracy in a way as well that I guess that's clear and that's a big topic being discussed right now we have to leave it at this not before because otherwise somebody will hit me uh, I have to ask you <laughs> please visit the museum upstairs the pop-up museum uh, you can record your own uh, what-if statement that you hopefully thought about during this session. Thanks uh, for coming. Sorry again about the, uh, the translation thing, but I think this all worked out. I want to thank our guests, all of them, obviously, but Mr. Eismar in particular. Thank you so much uh, for coming.